What if church wasn't just a building, but thousands of doors, each of them opening up to a journey that could actually change the world? Would you come? Rethink Church at 10,000doors.org, the people of the United Methodist Church. Good morning, Central Church. Welcome to worship this second Sunday of Advent. This Sunday we speak to the hope of Christ coming. May the Holy Spirit be with us in this time together. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts and spill out into our lives and into this world. May the Holy Spirit meet us here as we seek to meet God. Good morning from me as well. I'm Nancy Jones, the liturgist for this morning. I'd like to extend a special welcome to those of you that are joining us either on TV or through the internet. We're glad you're with us. We hope that our service today will bring you special blessings. On behalf of the Central Church family, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to any of those that are visiting with us today. If you happen to like, want a little bit more information about our church, you can find packets at either entrance door or in our welcome center. Just a reminder to sign and pass the friendship pads that you find in the pews. Now, if you take a look at the bulletin at all this morning, you will see that there are a lot of announcements. Um, besides the regular bulletin, on the back of the order form for the Altar Guild poinsettias uh, are also some more announcements, so I encourage you to take a look at those as well. I'd like to highlight a few for you. ...of the Advent candle. I would like to invite the Warden family to come up, Derek, Heather, and Bailey.
This wreath of candles and evergreen reflects our joy at Christ's coming. The candles reflect the eternal light of God, Jesus Christ. The evergreen branches signify life and hope. Our lighting of the candles and prayer each Sunday remind us that we are an Advent people who wait and watch in constant and joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. This wreath, then, is a symbol of our faith, that Christ's light and life will triumph over evil and death, that our hope in God's grace and love will never leave us disappointed. Today we light the second candle of Advent, the candle of hope. It is hope that carried the Israelites into the Promised Land. It is hope that led the prophets to cry out for God's coming. It is hope that nudges us to look for the holy in this unholy season. Seek God amidst the tinsel. Pray for joy in the midst of joyless situations. A Christian's hope is that Christ will come and the world will accept him. Not that this will change the world, but that we will change and be stirred to bring God's realm to reality. Today we come to God in hope, knowing that God will meet us in the Christ. A poem by Ted Loder called Give Me Hope. O God, this is a hard time, a season of confusion, a frantic rush to fill my closets, my schedule, and my mind, only to find myself empty. Give me hope, Lord, and remind me of your steady power and gracious purposes, that I may live fully. Renew my faith that the earth is not destined for dust and darkness, but for frolicking life and deep joy. That being set free from my anxiety for the future, I may take the risks of love today. Let us pray together. Holy One, restore in us that childlike hope that looks for the gift and seeks the promise. Let your spirit show us what is we truly want and need for Christmas. We hope for you today and always. Amen. Let's join together in singing number 567 in the Red Book, Heralds of Christ.
And now with words, handshakes, or hugs, let us share with each other the, prince, the peace of Christ. If I can have the children come on up, come on up and have a seat. since Victoria was the first one up here. You want to be my assistant? Sure. All right. Here, you hold on to that. All right, just for a minute. I'll get it back. Okay. Hi, guys. Does everybody know what this is a picture of? Sheep. It's a sheep, right? A real sheep. It's a real sheep, yep. Well, this is Frankie, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about Frankie, and then maybe you can answer me, okay? So is it, we get... Things from sheep, we get wool, we can get milk. Yeah, this sheep can have another sheep to make more sheep. So all of these things, you know what the important part is? All of these things can help a family. If a family owns sheep, they can make a living. They can feed their children. Their children can afford to go to school. And... It just, it just makes life a lot easier when you can eat, when you can go to school, and you can pay for things, right? So do you know how a family can get a sheep or a bunch of sheep like Frankie? How? If they could, if they could have a farm, they would have, like, lots of sheep. Yeah, they could have a farm. They could have lots of sheep. Well, you know what we can do? We can't really buy them a farm, but here at Central, we can collect money. And for $120, we can send that money to Heifer International, and they can actually give these people a sheep. They can give them a whole bunch of sheep, actually, if a bunch of people like us put money together, right? So what our goal is, is we're, we're going to collect money, and we're going to take a sheep like Frankie, and we are going to send him across the world to somebody else, Okay. Just to let you know, if, has anybody, um, if you come in the back door, on the bulletin board, there's a big picture of Frankie. And Frankie has cotton balls stuck to him. It looks kind of funny. But for every time somebody in the congregation, or us here, every time we go and we donate money towards buying Frankie, more cotton balls go up on the poster. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to buy a sheep for Christmas for a family. On top of that, guess what this family has to do to, if they get the sheep? Do you think they have to pay for the sheep? What do you think they have to do? I think they have to own. Um... It's okay. They have to actually do something what's called passing it on. They have to take one of their baby sheep and give it to somebody else, and they have to teach them how to take care of it. So... It actually is, we're not only helping the first family, but we're helping every family that the family helps after that, okay? So you guys want to say a little prayer? Samantha, you want to hold this for me? You hold my sheep, all right? You guys good, you guys good with saying a prayer after me? Okay. Dear God, Dear God thank you for Heifer International. And thank you for this wonderful congregation. who's going to help these amazing children to give a family a new sheep and a gift for Christmas. With our one sheep, we hope to make a difference so that children can eat and go to school. Please help us to remember when we write a check to put sheep in the memo line. <laughs> we are thankful for what we have. Amen. Amen. Okay, real quick, you guys. Anybody know what Frankie says? You know what he says? 
No, he says, Mer. Frankie stands for frankincense. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 68 through 79. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for God has looked favorably on God's people and redeemed them. 
the Lord has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. As spoken through the mouth of the holy prophets from old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us. Thus God has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered the holy covenant, the oath sworn to our ancestor Abraham, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve God without fear, in holiness and righteousness before the Lord all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare God's way, to give knowledge of salvation to God's people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadows of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And now I'd like to invite Knut Hansen up for a stewardship moment. Good morning, all. There was a phrase in the uh, lighting of the Advent wreath prayer that, that struck me. Frolicky love and deep joy. May we all practice that the rest of this Advent season and throughout our lives. The spirit is alive within the central family, and it's wonderful to see when we're around each other, wherever that may be, see that at work. Thanks to all of us for our faithful giving. Just give you an update on the results of the stewardship campaign. It's still ongoing, it's not complete yet, but as of this week, about 50% of those who have committed in the past have committed and, and are maintaining their same level of giving. Fortunately, 25% have actually uh, increased, uh, pledged to increase their giving in 2016. Uh, but we're still waiting about 20% that haven't uh, yet uh, handed in their pledge or their commitment. So we'd remind those of you who haven't, please do so, so we can finalize our plans for 2016. Just give you an update on the budget it, uh, for 2016. It is very responsible. Uh, there's a, an increase of $1,000 over this year, which is less than a third of a percent. So um, any you know, giving that we have will help with our financial commitments in 2016. Just a reminder on 2015, you've seen the last couple of weeks in the bulletin, the uh, reminder to continue the giving for 2015. Excuse me. We're a little bit behind in uh, this year, and as a result, we've had to rely on some emergency funds to help maintain our commitments. So we remind you in the spirit of giving to think of Central um, if you've fallen behind, if we'd ask that you please catch up for, uh, by the end of the year. Also a reminder, there's two ways to give electronically. You can either give uh, through um, direct payment through your uh, uh, savings account for the bank, direct deposit to the church, or through credit card. Uh, there's now an app that enables you to pay by credit. So we again thank you for your commitment to Central, and we ask that you continue your spiritual giving, both financially and through your works and deeds, to maintain the work here at Christ strong, as, uh, to maintain our ministries and programs as we maintain the face of Christ in the community. As we come to our time of giving, we want visitors to know that we consider your time here with us a gift. As our guests, please do not feel obligated to place anything in the offering plate. God comes to us today speaking hope and offering life to all who love him. Let us give thanks by offering our gifts.
All, co all things come from you, O oh God, and of your own have we given you. hope in this season of Advent, this time of waiting, we offer to you our money, our time, our energy. Place your blessings on our gifts so that they will be used to shine the light of your hope in the dark places of our world. Amen. Let us remain standing to sing song number 203 in the Red Book. Mike and Linda Davies, Jennifer and Richard Erickson, Roger and Helen Failing, Horace and Marie King, Mel and Norma Livingston, Tom McGee, Chet and Joanne Nizalek, and Carl Northrup. And special prayers for church family and friends go out to Sarah Wells, Bill Weber, Bob Oney, Amy Clock, Ron Ronaldo, Jim Schulte, Jean McGee, Ann Neal, Linda, and our homebound members. And we extend our sympathy to Ray Wilcox on the death of his wife, Sally. Uh, Sally and Ray are neighbors of ours that just live across the street on Union Street, and so um, our sympathy is extended to them. Friends, there were two mass shootings this week. You heard about one. I don't know if you heard about the other one in Georgia. A mass shooting is becoming commonplace, but it means an incident in which four or more people are shot to death in one incident. Twice that happened this week. Fear is among us. We are afraid of international terrorism. We are afraid of domestic terrorism. Fear runs through this country. And so as we come into this time of prayer today, let us hold with us all those who are living in fear, all those who are growing in fear. I have friends this week who received instructions for their children on what to do during a lockdown in their schools. I've had friends receiving instructions from their workplaces what to do if a shooter comes in. We live in a country where this is real. So let us hold all those in fear with us as we pray today. Let us be in prayer together.
holy and gracious and loving God, as we talk about hope today, we admit that we need it. To the deepest parts of our souls, we need your hope. We need enough hope to combat fear, to overcome fear. We need enough hope to see the bright light that you shine into this world. Help us when we are afraid. Help us to comfort others in their fear. Your hope, your hope is what keeps us hanging on. Hope that fear will rest and peace will come. Hope that life will be as you created it to be, with joy and love and brightness. In this season, help us hold on to the dream of hope. Help us begin to live it. Help us begin to share it. There are some who will never see it unless they see it in us. So fill us. Full to overflowing with your peace, your hope, that we may offer it to the world. We have prayed already, mentioned names and families, folks who are struggling in one way or another, who are sick, who are facing fears of their own. But we carry more with us, family and friends, other names not in the bulletin. And so in this moment of peace and silence and grace, we offer their names as we speak them aloud. So many stories, so many cares. For those among them who have lost hope, help us hold it for them until they can claim it again for their own. Lord, in your love, hear our prayers. For we ask each one in the name of Jesus the Christ as we offer to you the prayer he first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's second reading is from Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 20 from the message. In the 15th year of the rule of Caesar Tiberius, it was while Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, ruler of Galilee, his brother Philip, ruler of Ituria and Trachonitis, Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the chief priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, John, Zechariah's son, out in the desert at this time, received a message from God. He went all through the country around the Jordan River, preaching a baptism of life-changing, leading to forgiveness of sins, as described in the words of Isaiah the prophet. Thunder in the desert. Prepare God's arrival. 
Make the road smooth and straight. Every ditch will be filled in, and every bump will be smoothed out. The detours straightened out, all the ruts paved over. Everyone will be there to see the parade of God's salvation. When crowds of people came out for the baptism because it was the popular thing to do, John exploded. Brood of snakes, what do you think you're doing slithering down here to the river? Do you think a little water on your snake skins is going to re deflect God's judgment? It's your life that must change, not your skin. And don't you think you can pull rank by claiming Abraham as father? Being a child of Abraham is neither here nor there. Children of Abraham are a dime a dozen. God can make children from stones if he wants. What counts is your life. Is it green and blossoming? Because if it's dead wood, it goes on the fire. The crowd asked him, Then what are we supposed to do? If you have two coats, give one away, he said. Do the same with your food. Tax men also came to be baptized and said, Teacher, what should we do? He told them, No more extortion. Collect only what is required by law. Soldiers asked him, And what should we do? He told them, No shakedowns, no blackmail, and be content with your rations. The interest of the people by now was building. They all were beginning to wonder, Could this John be the Messiah? But John intervened, I'm baptizing you here in the river. The main character in this drama, to whom I'm a mere stagehand, will ignite the kingdom life, a fire, the Holy Spirit within you, changing you from inside out. He's going to clean house, make a clean sweep of your lives. He'll place everything true in its proper place before God. Everything false he'll put out with the trash to be burned. There was a lot more of this, words to give strength to the people, words that put heart in them, the message. Today's gospel reading is about hope. It may not sound like it at first with all that brood of snakes stuff, but it is about hope. It begins with a voice. A single solitary voice is calling in the wilderness. That's a subtle beginning, even though the entire force of history is steamrolling and snowballing and rushing in a crescendo to this very moment that John is pointing to. Centuries and centuries of expectations, not just for the Israelite nation, but for all of creation, are about to be realized in the coming of the Son of God. And in the inbreaking of the kingdom of heaven, this is it. The reader should feel the tension, should almost taste the expectation as we hear about the coming of the kingdom of God fulfilled in the coming of Christ. John is saying, get ready. You have prayed for it. It's now. I think we sometimes feel that way about Advent and Christmas. We want to get through with all this preparation stuff and get right to the Christmas moment, to the big moment when it happens, the punchline of the story of God's becoming human. We want to hurry so we can hear the angels singing to the shepherds watching their flocks by night. We want to hurry so we can see that little town of Bethlehem and the baby in the manger. We want to be done with the shopping and get to the unwrapping. But then it happens. Smack in the middle of this Advent season, we run into a detour. In the midst of this season, we come to this gospel story. It appears every year in the lectionary. And there are no angels, and there is no baby in the manger, and there are no silent nights, and there are no shepherds. What happened? It's some guy preaching in the desert. An expectation is built up as we enter into Advent, but what we see today isn't what we expect. Instead, there's this ridiculous picture of this lone voice telling us, no shouting to us, that we cannot get to the manger from here. 
He's telling us we have to back up, turn around, and repent. Now, if you want a translation, you want a Greek today, didn't you? The word is metanoia for repent, that we translate as repent. And it means change your mind, turn around, choose a new plan, choose a new way of thinking, a new way of living. We can't get to the manger so quickly without turning back to God. The message of this Advent Sunday is a simple one, but we don't seem to want to hear it, really. Think about it. Raise your hand if you have a little figure of John the Baptizer in your nativity scene at home. He's not there. John's got a message with which we're awfully uncomfortable, if we're honest, and in which it's difficult to see the hope. Because what does repentance have to do with Christmas? Usually we think of that word in terms of Lent, coming up to Easter. But when you look at it, it has everything to do with it. Repentance is more than feeling sorry or bad for our sins through a fear of retribution. Repentance really is a complete turning around. It's a, it's a 180 degree change of our mindsets and our behaviors and our hearts. It's a willingness to turn away from our selfishness and our tendencies to sin and to turn back towards righteousness and peace and justice and faithfulness. It's a willingness to turn and let God return to being the center of our lives and to let the love that we find in the manger transform us. The preacher John out there in the desert proclaims that until we do that, we can't get there from here. We don't expect this message in this season of joy, but that unexpectedness is at the heart of the gospel message. Christianity is full of paradox. Just when we think about Christmas, just when we think Christmas is all about a baby in a manger, we get this 2,000-year-old prophet with a loincloth and locust breath telling us what to think. That was funny. Boy, when I gotta give it to ya. <laughs> Just when we think that Christmas is all about a baby in a manger, we get. Oh, I said that. Just when we might start. <laughs> you threw me. You were supposed to laugh at the locust breath. <laughs> Just when we might start to think that God is a God who tests us and judges us, we hear the scripture tell us that God has sent a roadmaker to pave the way for us. A roadmaker who makes the way smooth to encounter God's glory. Just when we think God is a faint voice in this crazy world of ours, this post-Christian world as some call it, we get the shouting prophet sent by God and telling it like it is. Just when we think we're talking about generosity, instead of finding our stockings full, we hear Christ call us to give up all that we have with no thought of ourselves. Just when we expect freedom and life is our right, we hear Christ call us to follow him and to serve others and to witness and to die his death. Just when we think that bad guys always seem to win these days and that we will never see peace in our lifetime and that righteousness will never win out over all the evil we see in the world around us, we hear the words that all flesh shall see the salvation of God. That's shocking stuff. We expect that we know what's coming, tinsel and trees and baby Jesus, and we also know that eventually we'll reach the victory of Easter, so who cares? We hardly listen anymore. And so when we do, when we open our hearts to hear, really hear John's announcement, we are left stunned if we're really listening. The hope in the middle of John's message is that when we do realize where our center must be, when we do make that change, when we do make that turning, that repentance, that metanoia, 
God is there to meet us, to greet us with the Holy Spirit, to baptize us with blazing grace. God has prepared us a way to meet God's eternal, everlasting love, but it's not always what we expect. God's love is given freely to us, without price, without penalty, without judgment. It's always there, always alive, never something we have to wait for. Don't be fooled. When we talk about season as an advent of waiting, it's not waiting for God's love to be born. It already has been. The waiting of this season is the waiting for us to make ourselves ready to receive that love. It is God waiting for us to listen to the message of the preacher in the wilderness, that unlikely herald of the King of Kings. We can't reach the manger without readying our hearts to receive the love that's always been there. So on this second Sunday of Advent, are you ready for the unexpected? Are you ready to open your heart to the message of the wilderness prophet? Are you ready to rearrange your mind and your heart and your soul to receive God's love? (laughs) You know they say, be careful what you wish for. Why? You might get it. Can we pray honestly for the coming of the Christ? Can we pray honestly for the grace of God to prepare our hearts and do all that work Can we accept God's blazing grace offered to us in love and how it's going to work in our soul? And can we live the transformed life that God calls us to live when we take that love in? Are we really, really ready for what will happen when we pray those things? May God make us so. May we be ready. Amen. And so we we come to this table where you don't have to be ready yet. You don't have to be perfect ever. You don't have to be a saint. You're welcome if you're a sinner. Especially so, I think. You might get second helpings. You don't have to be Methodist. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to be anything special. You can be something super special. It just doesn't matter because this table is for all of us and for all the world and for all times and all places. This table is open and this meal is for us. May we come and taste and see that God is good. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It It is indeed right, Almighty God, for you made us, and before us you made the world we inhabit, and before the world you made the eternal home in which we have a place. All that is spectacular, all that is plain, have their origin in you. All that is lovely and all who are loving point to you is their fulfillment. And grateful as we are for the world that we know and for the universe beyond our understanding, we particularly praise you, whom eternity could never contain, for coming to earth and entering time in Jesus. For his life, which informs our living, for his compassion, which changes our hearts, for his clear speaking, which contradicts our harmless generalities, for his disturbing presence, his innocent suffering, his fearless dying, his rising to life, breathing forgiveness. We praise and worship you and offer our eternal thanks. Here too our gratitude rises for the promise of the Holy Spirit who even yet, even now, confronts us with your claims and attracts us to your goodness. Therefore, we gladly join our voices to the song of the church with its prophets and apostles with the weak and the willing, with the sinners and the saints. 
with all your people on earth and all the host of heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus, your anointed one, who came to us in the fullness of time. So now, lest, that, lest we believe that our praise alone fulfills your purpose, we fall silent and remember him who came because words were not enough. In him is your promise to scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts and to have mercy on those who love you from generation to generation. In him is your promise to put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. In him is your promise to fill the hungry with good things and to send the rich away empty. In him you come to be, Emmanuel, your presence with us. What we do here, we do in imitation of what Christ first did. To his followers in every age, Jesus gave an example and a command rooted in an experience he shared with his best friends, his disciples, his family, in an upstairs room in Jerusalem. On the night before he died, and as they were sitting at a meal, Jesus took a piece of bread, and he broke it after blessing it, and he gave it to them, and he said, this is bread, it's broken, but this, this is my body. It is broken for you. Take and eat and remember. And after the meal was over, he took the cup and he blessed it and he shared it among them. And he said, this cup is the new covenant. The new covenant with God, the new relationship with God, it's made possible through sacrifice and through love. This is my blood poured out. Take and drink and remember me. So now we do as Jesus did. We take this bread and this wine. We take this meal together and we remember the one who comes. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Merciful God, send now in kindness your Holy Spirit to bless this bread and this cup and to fill them with the fullness of Christ. And let that same Spirit rest on us, converting us from the patterns of this passing world until we conform to the shape of him whose food we now share. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever.
The one whom eternity could not contain is present to us in this bread. The one who calls us each by name is present in this cup. So come and take the meal that's set for you. Take and share this meal together. If our helpers could come forward, our ushers will guide you um, to come take communion as you feel moved. The bread is gluten-free. We take communion by intention that is dipping the bread into the cup. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Amen. As you go into this week, you're going to go not looking at your watch, but knowing I'll give you this time later. As you go, we're not benedicting yet though, so we're singing. That's right. Should we stand as body or spirit and sing? into this week and into this world. Go and be bearers of hope. Prepare the way of the Lord. Be voices in the wilderness saying that there is something better. Go and may the peace of the Christ, the peace of Emmanuel, the peace of the King of glory be with you. Amen.